Listen up. Welcome to the Louisville Urban League's radio show and podcast, which comes out every week on Thursdays. You can find us on 101.9 FM WLLV from 12 to 12.30 every Thursday, or you can find us anytime online on uh, any of your favorite podcast networks. So Apple, Google, Spotify, look us up, subscribe, rate us, review us, let us know what you think of the show. Welcome back. My name is Lyndon Pryor. I am the Chief Engagement Officer here at the Louisville Urban League. Some people call me the voice of the league, and it is my pleasure to be back again um, for the third installment of the show. And honestly, the third installment on this series where we have been talking about education here in Louisville over the last couple of weeks. And so this week, I am honored and pleased to be joined by two uh, JCPS students, and I just met them, honestly. And so this is going to be a really interesting (laughs) conversation moving forward. But I'm going to allow them to each introduce themselves to the audience. So if you wouldn't mind, sirs, please go ahead. Um, my name is Jalen. I go to Seneca High School. Uh, I'm more. I also go to Seneca High School. Thank you both for joining us here. And the point of this, as I was explaining before we kicked off, is really to get the student perspective on all the things that are going on. Um, There is a lot of stuff that adults um, and folks who are supposed to know better um, have been talking about with regards to education, particularly public education in Louisville and across the state of Kentucky. And we rarely get to hear from students. We rarely get to hear how this stuff is impacting you, what your perspectives on it are. Do you care? Do you not care? Um, What does it mean? What does it not mean? All of that sort of stuff. And so I just wanted to have a conversation with a couple of students and just to get your perspective and feedback. Obviously, you don't represent everybody. Um, You don't represent all black students. You don't represent all male students. Um, You don't even represent all of the students at your high schools. However, your perspective is important and it matters. And so we wanted to be able to take the time to be to to hear from you and, and learn a little bit more about what it is that you are thinking. So to kind of get this started, let me just kind of run down for the past three years, right? Like, so going back to the start of the pandemic in 2020, there's been a whole host of different issues. So we had obviously COVID and then there was NTI when we were going to school remotely, um, went back to schools and there was the great mass debate. Um, We started talking about vaccines and who gets vaccines or doesn't get vaccines. Um, We moved into this shift around anti-CRT and what gets taught in school. There was the student assignment plan. We have um, conversations around police in, in schools, SROs. Um, there's been don't get don't say gay bills now introduced um, in Kentucky and that are happening all across the nation. And now most recently, we've been talking about guns in schools being brought into schools by other students and whether or not we're going to move to metal detectors in schools and changing times for next year, which for you two, you're both seniors, I'll point out, won't necessarily impact you, um, but you may have some sort of uh, perspective on that. Oh, in addition to that, like there's been, you know, conversation around literacy and reading um, across the entire state. And so thinking about all of that, my question to to each of you, um, or really it's kind of a two part question is one, how much of that has made it into you all's conversation as students? Like how much of any of these topics have you heard about, Um, you know, or is it circulating amongst your peers in the halls? And then the second question on that is to the extent that you are familiar with any of these topics, what do you think about? Uh, Well, for me, all I've ever heard about was the, uh, was the don't say gay was the don't say a uh, gay bill but aside from that i haven't really heard about anything else being passed or anything being discussed really i've only really heard of the don't say gay bill because people like posting it on their stores and been like no announcements about it or anything like that it's just, i'm just having to find out stuff on my own uh me a lot of the times at school maybe not 
as much, but at home and when I hang out with friends, when I text my friends, a lot of the times uh, the issues come up in conversation. I could just be lounging around watching TikToks and then all of a sudden I come across a TikTok that tells me my ancestors had their hair taken and thrown into pillows or George Washington was wearing who could have been my great, great, great grandmother's teeth. Um, and, you know, I'm not all the time am I disheartened, but, you know, it makes you look at the world a little colder. Mm. So thinking about that, are these are these issues that you all wish were being brought to you more like in and how would that look in in your ideal world? Right. Like because these are things that directly impact you, right? Like what you learn in school, um, what your school environment looks like, uh, you know, how you all get taught or what you have the opportunity to learn are all things that directly impact you. Um, do you all feel like these are things that you should have some sort of a say in? Um, since I'm the one being educated, since I'm the one who's going through the 12 years or the 13 years or 14 years, depending on how long, if you go to pre-K or whatever, uh, I feel like I should have a say in it. I feel like once I hit like at least seventh grade, I should at least be able to raise my hand and say, hey, at this point of the year, like, can we have a vote on um, what we learn in my ag class, my senior ag class? This is the first time where my teachers actually been like, hey, you guys are going to get to learn like what you guys want to learn towards the end of the year. It has to pertain to horticulture. But if I got to see that in my history class or social studies class, what have you, uh, it'd be a lot nicer being able to learn like the true worst stories about slavery. I know that when I learned about it, it was, oh, they took these people by force. But that's about it. They're just like, they took them by force. It's never, they took them by force. And then they took parts of them. It's just, we saw them. We took them. What else did we do? Hmm. What about for you, Jen? Uh, well, I feel like it's just a no-brainer for us to at least have a say in what's go go on what we're going to have to be forced to go through. Like, we're forced to really go to school. If we don't go enough, then we're going to be arrested or whatever. And I just feel that we should have any type of say in what we're going to be taught. When we're, well, to, to a point, well, we should be able, we should know, we should know the full story in history. We should know, you should just be able to learn what we need to learn. So thinking about like, you know, I mentioned there's this conversation around um, guns in schools. There have been 15, 20 guns that have been found in schools across the district this year from middle school to high school. Um, and that, as of late, has been kind of a hot topic of debate. Um, is this something y'all are aware of? And what do you think about uh, well, we know that there's been guns that people who bring, we know that people have been bringing guns to school and the uh, main discussion, well, the main like solution that people have been, people have been trying to put was, uh, well, let's put, let's put metal detectors in, but that's not really going to solve the actual issue of like, why are they bringing guns to school? Like what is making people so angry? So, even, so like the press that they feel they need to bring a gun to protect themselves or just to kill someone that's been bullying them or something who... Like, and what's going to be done about that? Even if we ban guns, well, guns are banned anyway, but even if we put metal detectors in, we're still, there's still going to be people who are going to be violent, who are still going to be angry, who are still going to be depressed coming to school, who are not going to feel safe around others. Right. So that's one of the things that we talk about a lot with the league is like root cause issues, right? And that's kind of been our position as well is how are we addressing the why that something happens? Um, because to your point, I think you're exactly right. Um, simply removing the gun doesn't deal with the issue and it doesn't actually um, stop you know, the potential threat or the harm um, that may be done to an individual student. So we really got to tackle that. What about you, for Mark? Um, I don't know. I've never really thought of it as like, oh, someone's depressed. Oh, someone's trying to protect themselves. When I've heard stories about guns, when I've heard how they were found, it was always, oh, this dude was showing it off or, oh, like we found out that this dude had a gun because he was talking about it. And like 
there was one time where a dude whole jumped out of a window and left his backpack in our school that just so happened to have a just so happened air quotes have a gun in it and i've always really thought that it was more of a show of power a show of hey if i get in a fight with this dude I'm going to set it off. Uh, I don't really care about your life. I don't care about his life. I'm just here to show off and act tough or be tough in their own weird way. So you raise an interesting point that has to do with kind of the prevalence of gun culture, um, certainly in Kentucky, but really across America. And, And I guess my question for you all is, is, one of the things, and this is just kind of a personal opinion that I've hold, is that throughout history, schools, unfortunately, have been forced to wrestle with the misdeeds or the missteps of the greater society. Right. Like you go all the way back to like integration, like we schools were the frontier in which we had to integrate. But it wasn't so much that schools were were, you know, on the front lines of that. We had segregation all over the place. We had inequality, inequity all over the place. But schools became the frontier of like, well, let's do this here and let's make sure that it happens one way or another or another for good or for bad. Um, And let's deal with this issue in schools. Uh, The same thing happened in in COVID, right? Like how we deal with COVID and vaccines and masks. Schools became kind of the frontier of like, well, what does this mean? What are we going to do about this? How does this work? What does this look like? And that's that's where society kind of had their fight with schools. And the same is true, always has been true with guns, right? Like, and what do we do about this gun issue? For you all, right? Like, how do you see this divide or perhaps the the tension between what's happening in the world and then what you all are forced to deal with as students in schools? Um, Well, just recently, I quit my job at Starbucks. Uh, It doesn't really have anything to do with the current topic, but while I was working there, there was this man that he, he comes in and he orders like five, six drinks, and he'd always come in or at least most of the time he'd come in with like a gun on his hip. And this is a Starbucks. I'm sitting here making coffee, bro has a gun in my store. It, I'm sure he has an open carry license or what have you, but then I'm supposed to go to school and then have to worry about the fact that there's a gun in my presence. But then I'm at work and I'm just supposed to make a coffee while this dude is standing right here speaking to me and having a gun. So I feel like it's a little... There's a disconnect yeah. between like what we expect to, to exist out in society versus what what happens for you all in, in school. I, I haven't really had much experience with guns. Like I, I have a job and I'd have uh, police officers often come in. They'd have their gun on them. I just I work as a host. So I'm like the first person they see. I'm like, oh, hi. Hi. Oh, hi. Police officer with the gun. Hi. <laughs> and I see them, see them give them their takeout order and just have to kind of ignore that. And, and I guess in schools, it's the same argument that Mort was saying that you got, you kind of just ignore it, kind of, kind of just got to pretend it's not there. But like when you're in schools, it's just it's, you got to worry about that. So one of the other issues that um, has come up has been uh, around CRT uh, or what is really about anti-CRT bills is kind of how they've been um, talked about, which is in and of itself kind of a a, a, a mislabeling um, because CRT, critical race theory, typically is something relegated to graduate school studies, specifically legal studies, um, but something you would typically see as as a college student is not really a thing that gets taught into uh, in K through 12 education. But the idea around it, which I guess is the connection that gets made, is this idea of, of teaching about and talking about the connections between race and greater society, our laws, our policies, our politics, what the impact is. That's really the whole 
foundation of CRT. It's not necessarily to promote a particular ideological slant or not, but it is simply to say race has always been a big thing or a big deal in this country. And therefore, race has had an impact on these things. Let's examine what that impact may or may not be when it comes to certain things. And so that has made it into the conversations of of K through 12, as in, and we talked a little bit about like this idea of these don't say gay bills or um, anti-trans bills, ways in which to further marginalize the LGBTQIA communities. A lot of really cultural, um, cultural fixation in these bills around what are we going to do, whether it's Black people, people of color, or um, folks who are part of the LGBTQIA communities, like that has been a huge conversation for lots of folks, particularly at the state levels, um, but even here locally, all the way down to what books should be read. Or, you know, we're now back to talking about banning on books and y'all are both too young to remember real conversations about that. But that used to be a thing like we we used to try to ban books. People burn books um, in different societies. And it seems like we're headed back in that direction. How do those things resonate with you all? How do they how do they impact um, how you see not just, you know, your school experience, but kind of um, society as a whole? Well, with the uh, uh, the anti uh, the CRT, the only, like I've watched a lot of videos and I and like the only argument I've seen about people who like say no more critical race theory is that they don't want their white child to be hated by black by by their fellow black peers for for having like racist ancestors but then again there, there's a don't say gay bill which is just like saying hey don't which is just saying which is just trying to put hatred onto those same kids that are just that just happen to be gay or just queer in any way but, so i just kind of see a bit of hip, hip, hypocrisy in that like don't don't hate don't hate my straight white kid but if my kid happens to like boys don't to make sure to hate him or something like that. Um, Me, I think of it as you want to keep your statues of Confederate leaders in my state, in my city, in my park that I'm taking my kid to. And I have to tell my kid when they ask me, hey, who's that? Oh, he was one of the dudes fighting to enslave you. But then when I also come into the store and I have my boyfriend with me, I have to worry about oh, these people are going to look at me differently. They don't want their kids to see me, but they want my kid to see their ancestors who put me in terrible, well, put my ancestors in terrible situations. Um, With the whole don't say gay bill, the fact that they're literally allowed to just take a kid who's figuring out their identity and immediately outing that to their mother. I went through that, but it was more of like my mom found out herself. It's a horrible thing. My mom, I got lucky with my mother, but not everyone gets that lucky. And with the whole, uh, with the whole of race in general, when you are here and you're telling me, hey, I don't want to hear about what I went through because I don't want you to hate my kids. Well, not what I went through. I don't want to hear about what your ancestors went through because I don't want you to hate my kids. It's not about what your kids did. It's about what society did to us. And it's about how it affected society today. We don't hate your kids. I'm not telling my kids to go out and hate you, even though you're doing the same to me, kind of. It, if you're in a more right-leaning Christian household, you, you probably are. Um, so I don't. I feel like, you know, I should have a little bit more of a voice. Do you all find among your, I wonder, among your your teachers and administrators, um, does this come up? at all? Is this something that you see them wrestling with um, any of these issues? Um, my teachers, they haven't really brought up any of it. The only thing they brought up was that uh, we're gonna, we might start be starting school an hour or an hour uh, later, which not, not going to be my problem. I'm a senior. I'm leaving. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's really just all I've been uh, able to hear about when, when it comes to like next year, stuff that's being signed in. Mm. But yeah, that's just about it. Um, as I want to be an ag teacher when I grow up in the teaching field, there's already very few queer people and queer black people 
in the ag teaching field, there's only about three black ag teachers in the state of Kentucky. And Kentucky is a very big ag place. There's FFA literally all over the place. There's hundreds and hundreds of chapters here. Um, so a lot of the times when I talk to my teacher, Ms. Wright, or my teacher, Ms. Mattingly, they bring up the fact that, hey, we're really glad that you're like going into this because we need people with your diverse background here with us to bring more people into agriculture because agriculture is important. It feeds us. And like unifying things like that, things that keep our world turning, having everybody together in those scenarios is what they push me for. So I do hear about it quite a bit. So you bring up another hot topic around education in general, which has to do with kind of the teaching pipeline. So you may or may not know, like there is a shortage of teachers, of all teachers. Um, And then certainly when it comes to uh, black teachers, there are very few. And there are a whole lot of historical reasons and all of that sort of stuff. But it's interesting that you say you want to be an ag teacher. What made you want to go into education? Um, well, I, I do student aiding this year. I have gotten to connect with like freshmen just incoming into Seneca. Uh, it's been an interesting experience. They're different than me. They're less mature than me. And they still have to learn things that I learned four years ago. And I enjoy talking to them about what they talking to them about um, what we're learning. I enjoy going back over things. I enjoy just spreading like information, whether that be agriculture or otherwise, and influence, well, at least helping young minds build themselves up. How do we get more folks interested in teaching? Like what wouldn't, what do you think would help your peers to consider it? I mean, and obviously y'all are still in school, so you got four years for folks to make a decision if, you know, they decide to go to college, but in your mind, like what could help to start to build that pipeline? Well, a lot of things that people hear about when it comes to teaching is the fact that teachers don't make that much money or they don't make enough money for what they do. Um, I get that. But trying to pull away from that, fighting against it at the same time as pulling away from it, the more of us that go into that field, the more of us can fight for it instead of just kind of sitting on the sideline and being like, oh, I don't want to make little money and oh, I don't want to deal with kids. Basically removing a stigma around the fact that, hey, teaching is a job because all jobs are going to, well, all careers especially are going to be hard, but teaching especially, you feel like it's a little harder because you have to be on the front lines of kids and even adults in some cases. So picking up on that idea of, you know, Teacher pay being a a huge issue um, as to why somebody might not be in there. Let me ask the the question a different way Um, for both of you. In your opinion, is there value in being able to see and have teachers who look like you um, as you've gone through school? And I don't know if you've had any or, or not, but if you have, has that been valuable? And if you haven't, do you think it would be? I've only, well, I've seen, from uh, elementary school to maybe middle school, I've only had like white woman teachers. I haven't really had a teacher who looked like me. The only time I was taught by a, a black man was a sub was when he was a substitute. And that was like for a few days. <clears throat> but uh, that's really just all I kind of, kind of just like ignore it. I can't do much about it. I can't just like say, oh, I don't want this teacher. Give me another one. I got to just deal with that. But do you think it would have mattered? Like, is it something, let me ask you this. Is it something that you, you kind of wanted or, or wish for? And if, I mean, and no is a perfectly good answer on this, but I just wonder, is it something that you've ever thought about? I have to say, no, I don't really see how it would make much of a difference for me personally. What about for you, Mark? Um, Recently at school, we did uh, Valentine's Day sales. And when we sold flowers, like the students were able to see the flowers and then wanted to buy the flowers when I saw them. Um, when you see someone who looks like you or who has a lifestyle similar to yours, who's lived what you've lived, it makes you, it, in, it infatuates you. It brings you closer. When you can see it, 
you want to know more about it. It's like when humans looked up at the sky and they saw stars, they wanted to know more about stars. So if I see someone who looks like me, I want to know more about them. Like, I want to know how was your experience similar to mine? And with that connection, especially in teaching, it makes it easier for that student to want to sit there in your class, listen to you, talk to you, confide in you. And even with the don't say gay bill going around and some of that confidence legally having to be shared, um, it's still a better way to protect our children because kids have terrible thoughts a lot of the times. I go through it. I'm sure anyone listening to this has gone through it. Uh, you having someone to talk to about it makes a world of difference. <laughs> Do you feel like, because um, you, you raise the point about, you know, kids going through different things and needing to talk about stuff. Do you feel like you've had or your peers have, if not for you personally, um, the emotional support that you need in school to be able to deal with whatever um, it is that you're going through? In schools, maybe. I hear a lot, I hear sometimes people talk about going to our school, uh, I think she's a mental health counselor, Miss Mondale. I hear them talking about going to her, talking to her, her helping them through things. But me, through my experience, I was put into therapy when I was in elementary school. I didn't know it was therapy. I thought I was just playing games with some random old white lady, but you know, <laughs> um, I, I had fun. She made me talk about my feelings and I talked about them and you know, along the line, like along the way, I got I used to be a pretty big problem child, but I got a better hold on my anger, the issues that I had. So in some stages, yeah, in other stages, maybe not, because there's not that many teachers or administrative staff that I'd even want to consider talking to. Hmm. What about you, Jane? I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. It's completely okay. The Louisville Urban League wants to make sure that every student thrives academically. And to make that possible, the league is offering free intensive tutoring to JCPS students who qualify. Kindergarten through 12th grade students can receive expert help in reading, math, and ACT prep. Kids like me deserve every opportunity to succeed and to reach our greatest potential. To sign your student up today to learn more, visit lul.org or call 502-585-4622. The Louisville Urban League Derby Gala is happening May 3rd featuring musical guests Joe, Drew Hill, and Stokely. Listen Up listeners can win a pair of tickets to the show. All you have to do is tune in weekly to the Listen Up radio show, listen for the contest keyword, then email giveaway at lul.org with your name, phone number, and keyword. Contest runs from March 2nd through April 15th, 2023. One entry per person per episode with seven chances to win. The contest is open to adults 18 and up. This week's keyword is... Georgia Davis Powers. So let's talk a little bit about like the experiences that you all have had, right? Like, so again, thinking about some of the policies and things that have um, come up, they are greater than just what you get taught or or what happens. Like they, they really are dealing with um, experiences that you have in life, right? Like things that you are experiencing there in school, whether that be um, homophobia or racism or classism or those types of things. Um, are those things that you would say that you've experienced? Um, and is it something that you've experienced in school or as it relates um, to your your educational experience, whether that be from a teacher or administrator or from your peers? Well, in uh, second grade, uh, you'd think my you'd think my uh, second grade classroom was like a segregated classroom. Um, for like one, one, within the first week, she the, the teacher had us take a placement test. I was a bit I was a bit of a smarter kid, so I got into 
the smart group, the dumb, the, I'm not going to say dumb, but like the people who are in the secondary group, uh, they were all uh, kids who looked like me, you know, black kids. And they were just alone. They were just sitting at their desk and the group A kids uh, were sitting at this table with the teacher. And that was me and just a bunch of other white people. Just, and she would give most of attention to, uh, us, the group A, and group B, she would just give like a, a paper assignment and just be like, all right, do it. And I just felt odd just being at group A. I talked to my teacher about it. She One day she just like put me in group B and I just had to do work. It just felt weird. It felt like a t- completely different classroom while I was still in the same room. Did, did your parents ever asked for like an explanation as to like uh, i know my mom uh she talked she um talked with the teacher uh, it was years many years ago i i say many years ago uh yeah you're not that old but, <laughs> <laughs> but i don't really remember too much i just remember just feeling weird like seeing all these kids look like me being in this "Quote unquote dumb group." While I was in the smart group, like was just a bunch of white kids who couldn't really relate to. Hmm. What about for you, Mark? Um, well, our high school principal. Uh, I don't know how controversial this will be, but I was walking through the hallway the first thing in the morning. I walk through the doors. Mr standing right there. I have my AirPods in. Um, and he stops me and he asks me a question. So I look at him and I, I turn my music off and I say, huh? And he says, are you listening to the new Juice World?" And I'm just like, you know, that's, that's, that's a bit of a, what, microaggression? Is that what that's called? That's what they yeah. call. <laughs> I'm just like, uh, no, uh, no, that by this time, Juice World had already been dead. So, you know, he just saw a black creator and he was like, oh, this black kid who's walking through the school must be listening to Juice World. At least that's how I felt. That's that's how it felt to me. If he hears this, I'm sure he'll be happy to give me an explanation. But good luck finding me. Um, and, you know, there have been other times that it's been more like in my face. I got literally called, excuse my French, faggot at National Convention when I went um, in October uh, as I was walking past these group of white girls and they immediately got white knighted by their own. Um, uh, advisor, she was like, oh, my students would never say something like that, even though five of us walking down just trying to go get us something to drink, heard it clear as day. Um, first day that I was there to, it almost ruined my three-day experience, but I got through it saying all that to say that, yeah, it's, it's been there. Where have you found um, support and 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 advocacy in those moments, right? Um, with the national convention one, my teacher, Miss Mattingly, uh, she sat us down. The group of people who were there, she's another FFA advisor too. So I'm not saying that they're all like the White Knight, but she sat us down. The group of people who heard it, I was honestly, I was crying because I was like, why, why here? Why my time that I paid to come here? Why should I have to deal with this? But um, she sat us down. She gave us this like 10 minute speech. And at the end of it, she basically told us about her having to fight for her place in ag because she's a woman and how we're going to have to fight our own battles, but how we should still demand our space. So I found it in my ag teachers or my friends. Mm. Well, that's awesome. And that's powerful because I think it's important to recognize that like schools, administrations, teachers, I mean, they're all people, right? Like they bring all of their stuff um, to the classroom, just like everybody else does in any other work environment. Um, And so there's no way that we could expect um, that any of them would show up perfect or would behave perfectly. But what is critical is that when they do, when someone does step out of line, that A, there is accountability, hopefully, um, that there is correction there by somebody in a position of power and authority, but then also that there are folks who are there to support um, and uplift and, and help 
anyone who's been wronged or harmed uh, in any kind of way. And so I, I am I'm glad to know that there was somebody um, for you in those experiences and that Jalen, like, you know, you had parental advocates who were able to step in um, and, you know, for your experience all the way back to, to second grade, because that's that's really important. But we know that that's not always the case and that, you know, somebody isn't always there. And so part of what we want to do is be able to build a bigger and broader community of of advocates and supporters. But ultimately, the real thing is making sure that the system works the way it's supposed to, right? Like we want to have a system so that there are less instances of these overall um, so that those things are, are far more rare than sometimes they are for some individuals. And then that way, you know, we don't need as many people to, to to care for and to pick up and sustain because we have an environment and a system that is doing that all on its own. And so that is the work um, that we do at the league. And we know that there are lots of other partners and students um, that are doing that as well. So as we get ready to wrap up, I, I will ask you all this. You're both seniors, so you're about to go out into the world. I don't know um, what the plans are, whether it's college or career next. But what I would ask you is, what is your hope and dream uh, for the world? And when I say world, it is however you choose to take that, right? Like whatever your sphere of influence, whatever you see that is, um, what is your open dream for the world around you? Um, and how do you plan to impact that world in a positive way? I'm just hoping for less hatred, more acceptance. That feels like almost maybe every month or every week there's a new bill being passed, uh, silence gave. This sounds uh, people of the LGBTQ. We know about the don't say gay law, the uh, not don't say gay bill. Sorry. Uh, and aside from just like outing outing kids to their parents, there's a, there's a it allows a student students who are like transitioning to just be taken off their pill taken off their uh, uh, their pills or whatever to help them transition, which I just don't think is right. Why why is it really your business to tell them who they should be, whether or not they were born one one gender. Why can't they just be someone? Why can't they just be who they feel they are? Um, me, I want to go out. I want to be able to pull people in who are like me. I want to be able to pull people in who have had similar experiences. I want to be able to show people that this world does not have to be a big divide as much as I could be cynical or a bit mean at times. I do want to see a world where I can just kind of do what I want to do, be who I want to be, and not immediately have to think, well, will there be a repercussion to this action that I can't really live happily without? Um I simply just want to live in a world that at least makes me happy because my happiness is what matters. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you both um, for this time and, and being honest and candid um, and vulnerable to to an extent. Um, again, I know this is weird um, to sit down and have a conversation like this with somebody who you met 45 minutes ago. Um, and so I appreciate that candor and uh, just your willingness to be open. I will say, that there are a lot of things going on in the world and certainly around the world of education. And for all that is wrong or perceived to be wrong um, about it, I am constantly, um, thankfully through this work, reminded of the goodness that exists in the students we have, in the teachers, in the administrators who are going out and doing this work every day 
for the creativity and the genius and the brilliance that you all uh, display all the time in all sorts of different ways. Um, and just the ways in which you all show up in spaces like both of you have done here, um, showing up in love and compassion for students who you don't even know um, or students that you haven't met, just wanting to make sure that all of the kids across JCPS and quite frankly, who are in school everywhere are going to have the best experiences and the greatest opportunities to thrive. So thank you all for for embodying that um, in this conversation. Thank you all for embodying that in your day to day lives. It truly does mean more uh, perhaps than you realize, like it resonates um, and it helps those of us who are fighting on the outside uh, to make that space safe and welcoming and equitable and whole, um, it gives us fuel um, to, to keep going and to keep doing it because we know um, that there are folks on the inside who will want the same thing and who are trying to do the same thing. So thank you both uh, for this time. Thank you all uh, at home for listening. Again, this is Listen Up. The Louisville Urban League's weekly podcast and radio show. And you can find us every week, Thursdays from 12 to 1230 on 101.9 FM or 1240 AM. And you can find us all the time um, online at your favorite podcast spot. Please be sure to uh, subscribe, rate us, review us, let us know what you think. Please have a great week. Thank you.